नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर आचार्य श्रीवात्सव गोस्वामी जी टुडे डिस्टिंग स्पीकर डॉक्टर गीतेश निर्माण को कन्वीनर ऑफ द विवेनार डिस्टिंग इनवाइटीज एंड डियर फ्रेंड्स इंटरेस्टेड इन महाभारत स्कॉलरशिप I welcome you all to the 29th session of this series of webinars on Mahabharata as hosted by the Department of Philosophy University of Delhi and Department of Philosophy Kamala Nehru College University of Delhi these webinars are being organized under the aegis of spark project which is the scheme for promotion of academic and research collaboration an initiative of Ministry of Education Government of India the title of the project is yoga consciousness in mahabharata and bhagavad gita an ethical value for societal and political well being we are working as a team uh, in this project along with uh, professor vishwa adluri uh, from hunter college city university of new york and joydeep dr joydeep bachi from uh, who is associated with hindu university of america and dr geetesh nirban who is hosting this uh, program Uh, from Kamala Nehru College, who is the Indian co-investigator, and me, Professor Bala, head of the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, uh, as the Indian principal investigator. Our extended team includes uh, Miss Jayshree Jha, Miss Anmol Preet Kaur, Miss Megha Kapoor, who are the research scholars in the in the Department of Philosophy at University of Delhi, and we are also supported by uh, Miss Deep Shikha. Uh, who is a, a master's uh, uh, student of uh, the department as far as the project is concerned it is a collaborative attempt to revisit the indian classical epic to explore yoga consciousness as one of its underlying messages while understanding how dharma as a result of yoga consciousness in mahabharata can well be interpreted for political and societal well being the project is a journey through the road map of yoga consciousness to delve deeper into the ancient indian wisdom for reviving the concepts of social responsibility and value embeddedness it is also a search for answers to the question of right action what is the right course of action and how do we identify it and how do we even if we identify how do we practice it how do we follow it these are the important aspects pointers that we would be dealing with in this project this series of webinars or our humble attempt to make the various aspects of mahabharata reach diverse audience who hold interest in the study of the epic we started this uh, series of webinars during the extreme phase of lockdown to engage minds with uh, the scholarship of mahabharata Uh, we have had the privilege of hosting scholars of repute from universities organizations in india and abroad wherein diverse topics related to mahabharata and bhagavad gita have been touched ranging from social and political well being and then karma yoga instrumental violence and then environmental issues we we had a wide range of topics that were covered so far uh, as i said in the beginning it is the 39th 29th Uh, uh webinar which means we have covered 29 themes various themes related to mahabharata so far and we are very honored to have today with us acharya srivatsav goswami ji from vrindavan uh, who would be speaking on the narrative of krishna in mahabharata and beyond in fact uh, we, we we only had uh, glimpses of uh, the narrative of maha krishna in mahabharata in the previous lectures we couldn't devote the whole lecture on krishna so far and we are fortunate to have uh, uh, shri uh, acharya srivatsav goswami ji uh, who would be uh, speaking to us on the narrative of krishna in mahabharata and beyond so without uh, uh, wasting uh, or blocking the time i request dr geetesh <coughs> nirban to introduce uh, uh, swami ji acharya ji uh, to the audience uh, and take the proceedings further over to you dr geetesh thank you professor bala good morning and namaskar we are very honored to have amongst us acharya shri vatsgwa go swami ji who is a leading scholar of hindu philosophy in the vaishnava tradition shri go swami ji comes from the family of eminent scholars and spiritual leaders 
at Sri Radha Ramana Mandir of Vrindavan and is an expert in the Vaishnava philosophy and culture. Acharyaji has taught philosophy and religion at Banaras Hindu University. He has been a visiting professor at Heidelberg University, Germany, and has been associated with various learned bodies, including the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, the Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, and the Alliance for Religion and Conservation based in UK. He is the author of several books, including Celebrating Krishna, he is the director of the Raj Prakalpa, a multidisciplinary research project, which is in collaboration with Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, New Delhi. And we're very honored to even have Dr. Molly Kaushal joining us from IGNC today. This project focuses on various aspects of Vraja culture and history. Sri Goswamiji is devoted to interfaith relations globally and is one of the honorary presidents of the world body religions for peace in 2012 he was honored with a lifetime award of the sangeet natak academy for scholarship and service to indian culture we are privileged to have him on our board today and today acharya ji will deliver an address on the narrative of krishna in Mahabharat and beyond. I now hand it over to Acharyaji. Thank you, thank you, Gitesh. Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudiraye. I cannot express my gratitude enough to Professor Bala Devar Konda and Dr. Gitesh Nirvan for providing this opportunity to talk with you this morning on the narrative of Krishna in Mahabharata and beyond as a part of the Spark series. But to be honest, I have a predicament. And the predicament is that I come from a generation which is of Mahabharata. <clears throat> what to talk about studying Mahabharata or going into Mahabharata you are not even allowed to keep a copy of Mahabharat book in your home. If you do that, then you know what happens? The house or your home will turn into a Kurukshetra. So I have grown in that time where Mahabharat is no, no, and no. But still, I am here. That is my predicament. That is my predicament. It reminds, though, to me of a very interesting saying in Hindi. Gur khayenge aur gul gule se parhej karenge. We will take, we will sever the jaggery, but we will not touch the pancake made out of the gur jaggery. There, the saying is reversed. The good is Mahabharat. The main substance is Mahabharata. And the Gulgula, the Pua, the pancake is Bhagavad Gita, which is the best product, one of the finest product among other several other finest products of Mahabharata. Gita is one of the finest ones. For Mahabharata, which is good, no, no, no. For Bhagavad Gita, yes, yes, and yes. What to talk about taking birth? No Hindu can die without listening to the Gita. No obituaries can be written ever 
without a quote from Gita, no lies can be established in the court of law without putting the hand on Gita. So amazingly, Mahabharat, no, 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 no. And Gita, yes, 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 yes. It becomes the book of life and death. It becomes the book of lies and truth. It is very interesting to me. These 18 chapters of Mahabharata, acceptable, but from where it is coming, Mahabharata kabhi nahi ghar me lana. It is very interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> However, it is so encouraging what Professor Bala just shared with us is already the 29th in the series. And the amount of scholars who were introduced just now to me working on Mahabharata is a very encouraging phenomenon. It is now, it's like a revolutionary a revolution happening in the studies of Mahabharata. The taboo is broken and we are marching in Mahabharata with full gusto. So this encouraging active academic discourse where Mahabharata is the subject, but my fears are for the organizers, the duo of this talk on Mahabharata from a non-Mahabharati. So, looks like it is all a leela of our trickster, and trickster is none other than Krishna himself. And his narrative is very tricky. So let us focus upon him. Let us focus upon him. So the Mahabharat, which is basically a story of Kaurava and Pandavas. But although maybe in your Spark series, Krishna has not taken the center stage, but in Mahabharat, somehow he is on the center stage. Is there as a king? Is there as a kingmaker? He's a peacemaker and he establishes himself in Mahabharata as a worship deity, a worship god, right from Rajasuya to other places. And most famous, he establishes himself as a philosopher, counselor, and a guide. And Krishna in Mahabharata is on his own terms. And he plays very beautifully. He is an insider. He is an inside player in the game of Mahabharata. Yet he has the ability to watch the game from outside. He is completely involved and attached. At the same time, he can give a impartial detached counsel. And this capacity of Krishna fascinates me. It's very fascinating. Krishna in Mahabharata has been explored examined, studied in depth and details by many of you and also a huge scholarship has come out, not just in the English discourse on Mahabharata, but especially when I look, say, what is being done today in Bengali is amazing. If there is a narrative and a discourse on Mahabharata today, and if we do not take the name of Nirsingha Prashad Bhaduri as the first name in the contemporary discourse of Mahabharata, 
we have lost, we have missed the bus. And that is very fascinating, very encouraging. So that has been done. And I understand from a non Bharati point of view, which I am, who was disconnected from the Mahabharata tradition, academically and also culturally somehow. What can I add to this scholarship? I cannot even put a footnote there. So, whatever catches my imagination about Mahabharat, about Krishna in Mahabharat, is Krishna's journey to Mahabharat. From where Krishna travels to Mahabharat, where does he enter Mahabharat? and before entering what is happening. His fascinating personality making from a cowherd boy stealing butter to a king and a kingmaker is a fascinating journey for me. From a flute player flirting with his girlfriends to the singer of Mahabharata, Maha, uh, Bhagavad Gita. And these different facets are so different that some scholars are tempted to say that there cannot be one integrally related, one personality of Krishna, which is so bipolar, so diverse and so opposite to each other. It is not possible. So there must be several, several personalities of Krishna. And my tradition of Vrindavan says, Janma desi jaton vayadi tartas charthe subhagya sarat, that Krishna, who has no need to take birth, but he takes birth, but he manifests himself in three sections, three sarga. There are the threefold, three dimensional Leela of mind. And all those three Leelas are, none of them is less or false. What are the three Leelas? The Braj Leela, the Mathura Leela, and the Dwarika Leela. Mahabharat falls basically in the Dwarika Leela segment. Yatra Trisargo Amrisha. All the three dimensions of the Leela or the three sections or three periods of the Leelas are equally valid. So from that point of view, granted permission, I'm seeking your permission, both of my uh, mentors and guides and gurus sitting in front of me, granted permission, I shall bring glimpse of Krishna till he enters or till Vedavyas make him enter into Mahabharat in the Naga Satra. That is his first entry into Mahabharata. So what are the glimpses before that? And in doing so, there may be some academic short circuiting and it may cause some sparks when there is some academic short circuiting, definitely there will be some spark. Which in Garya to Niklengi. Ye baat dusri hai ke wo spark ka C nahi hoga, wo spark ka K hoga. So be careful and bear with me, please. I need your compassion. So Mahabharat, Gita, Krishna. we would have none of it, none of it, if there was not another Krishna, whose full name is Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa. If he was not there, we would have no clue who is Krishna and what was Mahabharat, where was it played and what is Gita. We are grateful to him. I don't know. We are grateful to him or we 
are suffering because of his gift of Mahabharat and gift of Krishna, both insoluble intrigues. So, Veda Vyas being the creator of Mahabharata, as a Kavi, Kavi is not merely a poet. There's a tremendous activity called creativity goes on there. He's a creator and documenter of truth. And that is the fascinating concept of Kavi in the Vedic tradition. It's not merely a poet. So as a creator of Mahabharata, he is there with us. And he gave us an amazing chronicle of what happened. Because I have heard, I have not personally checked. I have heard that once Arjun was complaining to his grandfather, Vedavyasa, that Mahabharata is your poetry. Why did you induce such a bloodbath. You could have done an epic without a bloodbath. And the Vedavyasa's reply was, I wrote what I saw. Uh, given an itihas. So in that way, he gave us an amazing chronicle of what happened. Itihas, and it's a very significant word, which is dissected into three uh, terms in Sanskrit language. Iti, ha, as, which literally means, so indeed it was. So indeed it was. And that is what itihas is. Mahabharat as itihas. And this morning, our journey begins at, although it should not begin, it should begin somewhere uh, on the southern seashore, you know, where the sun is shining pleasantly and the nice breeze. We are all shivering already in the North India, but I will take you to further north. I want you to travel with me to Himalayas in the icy mountains. <coughs> where Veda Vyas has an ashram on the banks of river Saraswati in the place called Badrikashram, Badrinath. Veda Vyas's work, it is amazing. If you see, the mere classification of the Sangita of the Veda into four for the convenience of humanity, for the convenience of usage and understanding, he classifies Whatever is good to be known, that is the literal meaning of Veda. Whatever is good to be known, Veditabhya, he classified it and presented it in a, a very like a handbook, practical handbooks. But for those who are not privileged to have access to those books and access to the Vedic knowledge systems, he gave us. Bharat Akhyanam. Bharat Akhyanam. Which is Mahabharata. Along with the Puranas. And they became so valuable that Itihas Puranam cha Panchumo Ved Muchyate. That the Itihas and Purana have no less value than the four Vedas. Is the fifth Veda. It is something to be known, Veditabhya. So his whole enterprise was based upon a single motive, welfare of all people from all sections of society. Repeatedly, Vyas speaks about this, that I have gone into this enterprise for the Sarvabhut Hite, for the welfare of everyone, everyone. And Veda Vyas was aware of his own achievements. It was not that he was not knowing what he is doing. He was aware. And 
one sitting on the banks of river Saraswati in the self-critical mold, he said that, yes, I'm very happy that I had and I have led a pure virtuous life, which is very important for the creator to have that life. Because if you are talking about virtues in your creation, you have to be virtuous. And that is the Indian way of creativity. Devam Bhutva Devam Yajet. If you want to worship the God, you have to become divine yourself. So if you are going to establish dharma, which is the motive of uh, Veda Vyasa, then he had to live a pure dharmic life. And he is grateful to his gurus for that. And finding Vedas, this is another realization of Veda Vyasa. When he find Vedas impenetrable for the common people, he opened the gate of understanding of the Vedic meaning by writing Mahabharata. And that was a game-changing moment. Game-changing moment open access to the Vedic system through Mahabharata, through Mahabharata. And he did that, once Vyas says, so that even the deprived classes can attain dharma, artha, kam, and moksha, all these purusharth without differentiation, without differentiation. So in that moment of self-analysis, something else, else happened. Vyas felt miserable. And he uses the term himself, asampan eva abhati. I'm very poor. I have not achieved anything yet. Having done all this, he is saying, I have not achieved anything. I have no, nothing to show, no accomplishment to show. Asampanna, completely deprived of any achievement. So he puts a question to himself. He says, what did I miss? What went wrong? What did I miss? And he answers himself. He says, probably I have missed some dimension of dharma which could lead us to the highest realization. And I quote his words, dharmana prayena nirupita. Some specific facet of dharma I have missed. This is after writing the Puranas and after writing Mahabharata, he is analyzing himself. He has just completed writing Mahabharata. And he says, dharmo prayena Na Nirupita. So, when Vyas was in a self critical mood, feeling incomplete and empty, his guru, Devarshi Narad, descends. He comes to Vyas. And after the exchange of greetings and niceties, Narad goes into a very interesting trip. He says he lords Vyas for his feet of completing Mahabharata. He said, Vyas, you have done something impossible. You have finished writing Mahabharata. That itself is the biggest achievement you could ever have. And he says, why I say that? Because this Mahabharata must have answered and fulfilled all your quests. Jigyasa. This is the final answer to all your quests. And Mahabharata, he says, is nothing less than a wonder. Nara says, Paramadbhuta. Paramadbhuta is absolutely wonderful. And this Mahabharata, Nara says, augments the meaning of all the wisdom. Whatever wisdom in this world is, 
is incomplete without the support of Mahabharata. So here, you have missed something. Despite you have not only inquired into the highest truth via Mahabharata, you yourself has realized the highest truth as well by writing Mahabharata. Not only that you have gone into the academic search of, Mah of the truth, but you have lived it, you have experienced it. And we will all agree with Narada. Narada's assessment of Vyasa's work is amazing and is very agreeable. Mahabharata, a rich encyclopedia of Indian culture. Nobody will dispute that. If Mahabharata is not there, no Kalidas. If Mahabharata is not there, on the other extreme, there'll be no Shankaracharya. There'll be no Advaita Vedanta. There will be no Brahma Sutra Tikas. There will be no commentaries on Gita. If Moksha Dharma is not there. If Mahabharata is not there, there is no Chanakya. There's no Arthashastra and so on and so forth. We can go on, we can go on. So the richest encyclopedia of Indian culture, and there is a popular saying we all know that what is in Mahabharata is also outside Mahabharata and what is not in Mahabharata cannot be found anywhere. And I think it has a lot of a sense in it, but the pancake coming out of Mahabharata steals the show. And one of the commentators of Mahabharata, Nilkantha, he says, Mahabharata is beautiful. Mahabharata is beautiful because it opens the meaning of Vedas. But more important than Mahabharata is Gita, it's 18 chapters because Gita and opens the meaning system of Mahabharata. And that's why Gita is Sarva Shastra Mai. And another commentator, Sridhar Swami, a legendary commentator on Gita, he says, Kimanyai Shastra Vistra. If somebody has touched Gita, then he or she does not require any reference to any Shastra anymore. So these two Shastras, Mahabharata and Gita, it's baby. They are universally acceptable, comprehensive contribution to human mind. But Narad adds, Despite all these marvelous achievements, you look sad and unaccomplished. Vyas has not told anything of his own agony to Narada yet, but Narada gauges the mood of Vyas and he says, you look very unaccomplished and you look very sad, depressed. And Vyas agrees. He says, having done all this, I am not satisfied. Having written Mahabharata and Gita and everything, I am not satisfied. Tathapi, even then, Tathapi, despite writing Mahabharata and Gita, I am na atma paritushyate me. The world may say anything about the glory of Mahabharata, but I am not satisfied. My Atma is not poor, is incomplete. And he begs to Narada, please show my shortcomings. Where did I fail? It's a wonderful academic discourse between the teacher and the student. The humility that I have failed. And the Atma is the witness. He need not go to the examiner for the worth of it. But he himself is doing what you call the self-assessment. 
मे न्यूनम विचक्ष शो माई शॉर्ट कमिंग एंड हैविंग गिविंग सीरियस थॉट नारद फाइंड से रीजन फॉर दिस शॉर्ट कमिंग इज व्यास I quote him, "You have not narrated the glory of Vasudev Krishna in Mahabharat. Listen to this again. You have not narrated the glory of Vasudev Krishna as you have narrated the glory of Chaturvarga, Dharma, Arth, Kama, and Moksha. Your nar your narration is focused on." chaturvarga rather than on vasudev krishna that is the glitch which is making which is tormenting you na tatha vasudevasya mahima hi anuvarnita na tatha in the same way you have not done fair treatment with the katha or the narrative of krishna you are not fair to krishna in mahabharata vyas find narad's diagnosis a bit intriguing and to us also it is very mysterious assessment of narada of vyas not properly narrated krishna in mahabharata what else did vyas do what is mahabharata and gita minus krishna and narad is saying you have not narrated krishna and if we take out krishna from mahabharata professor devar konda will you do you feel that the mahabharata stands it collapses and narad is still holds on to this he says natatha vasudevasya mahima anuvarnita you have not been fair to krishna and it is very intriguing very intriguing krishna is the thread and the lead actor in mahabharata we will not have any dispute much about it what remains to be said more vyas is wondering what more remains to be said then what are the dimension or elements missing in krishna katha or the narrative in mahabharata what are those narad knew it he knew those elements and those dimensions which were missing because he himself has access to those knowledge he has heard those as a child what manoharaha krishna katha pragayatam shanman as a orphan child narad has listened to the heart is stealing stories of krishna's leelas the ras is missing ras raso vaisaha the ultimate reality vyas is rasa upanishads declared and that ras is missing is missing so he prescribes to vyasa go to samadhi go to samadhi and in that samadhi you will get those missing leelas of krishna and remember them <clears throat> whatever you see in samadhi whatever you receive in samadhi you remember them and those leela will free all beings from all and every suffering when you narrate those leelas they will be the medium of freedom for everyone akhil bandha muktaye samadhina anusmara तद विचेष्टितम तद विचेष्टितम नारद एनकरेजेस व्यास बाय असर्टिंग 
that only you can narrate those leelas of Krishna. You are the only competent person who can bring forth those missing element of Krishna's narrative. Why? Because you yourself is the Kalavatar and Anshavatar of Krishna himself. You are the past partial manifestation of the absolute Krishna. So you alone is competent to bring that narrative forth. So thus instructed, Vyasa received Krishna and his leelas in his samadhi and he created, he presented whatever he received as a book called Bhagavat Purana. Bhagavat Purana. And to continue the tradition, he properly educated his own son into the knowledge of Bhagavat Purana. Bhagavat Purana. Here, I find a very interesting dialectic going on between Mahabharat and Bhagavat. Because Vyas has now given us two. He has given us already Mahabharata. And beyond the scope of a spark, there is another sparking text he has given called Bhagavat Puran. And I see a very interesting dialectic going on. Bhagavat begins where Mahabharat ends. And Mahabharat begins where Bhagavat ends. And this is about the history of the texts and the subject matter. Bhagavat begins with the birth of Parikshita and Mahabharat ends where Pandavas are going to Swargarohan. Mahabharat begins after the death of Parikshita, Navi Yagya, and Bhagavat ends with the death of Parikshita. Very interesting play going on historically. Interestingly enough, if you see in the order of creation, order of existence, Mahabharat came earlier, Bhagavat Puran came later. In the earlier text, the narrative of Krishna is of the later Krishna. But in the later text, the narrative of Krishna is the early Krishna. So the early text deals about the later Krishna and the later text talks about the early Krishna. Very fascinating dialectic going on. I don't know whether it fits in the Hegelian system, but still it is very dialectic. And anything for Krishna has to be dialectic, has to be playful. So Bhagavad, what is Bhagavad? Bhagavad is Pancham Veda. Panchamo Veda Muchyate. Sarva Vedanta Saramhi. Bhagavat is the sum total, the total essence of all the officials is in Bhagavat. Sarva Vedanta Saramhi. Bhagavat is also the natural commentary on the Brahma Sutras. So it is a Veda, it is an Upanishad, and it is also a commentary on the Brahma Sutra, the intellectual discourse which is very, very important. Any narrative without the intellectual discourse is not sustainable, cannot be sustained. So, Bhagavat is also described traditionally as Bharatartha Vinirnaya. If there is a confusion or there's a clash in interpretation, there's a hermeneutical problem in the Mahabharat text. Then where do you go for the treatment? 
the hermeneutics of mahabharata is bhagavat purana if you synoptically take these two then their symbiosis of meaning together makes the meaning complete so i don't know whether it is the heideggerian spiel going on or it is derrida's intertextuality going on the question is in the balls of the scholars i merely know these names i do not know what they mean so please enlighten me later on so bhagavat is also bharat arth and vrnaya including the meaning of gita the meaning of bhagavat or gita bhagavad gita and mahabharat can be properly understood only through uh, bhagavat purana so in that fashion let us see if we can better understand krishna in mahabharat by understanding who is krishna before mahabharat and beyond mahabharat and how did it all begin where did the krishna's journey begin let's get back to krishna krishna wherever krishna is he is tormented by his own what you call resolution and the resolution is yada yada hi dharmasya glane bhavati bharata whenever there will be decay in the sustaining values and systems for the welfare of humanity or creation i will intervene i will intervene and restore the system strengthen them and in those values and systems what is the param dharma param dharma for krishna is seva seva dharmo param gahana seva seva hi paramo dharma and what he sees wherever he is in the vaikuntha or goloka or whatever the eternal domain of the absolute he is tormented by this pledge he has taken and he sees that not only the institution and the process of seva is getting weakened but it's getting corrupted is getting corrupted and he is so shaken in his eternal domain that he says the corruption in seva is more deadly than no seva no treatment is better than bad treatment no vaccine is better than untested vaccine i'm not talking politically but i'm just showing krishna's concern concern so i have to go and restore seva for the good of this creation and specifically for the good of humanity where to go where to go where to intervene krishna has a drawback krishna as the almighty as the param purusha rasovaisa brahma adi purusha has always received seva has never done seva he is at the receiving end but to intervene for restoring seva you have to teach seva by doing seva so krishna said my god how can i do it this one way i have to first learn nijo na achorile bhakti shikhano na jaye is a famous statement of chaitanya mahaprabhu because bhakti literally means service or seva in sanskrit the root is from bhaj dhatu which literally means to serve 
So if you don't practice yourself, how can you teach others to serve? So he said, where shall I go? Where shall I go? Then he asked his tourist minister to supply him with the details that is there a Seva Dham or Seva Gram somewhere where I can go? As the narrative goes, the Seva Gram was not established yet. So that was out of question. That was ruled out. But there was a Seva Dham. He said, Lord, there is a beautiful place which is a highest service technology institute flourishing and surviving. He said, where is it? He said, Brindavanam. Brindavanam pashabhyam navakananam. He says, where did you get it? He says, the Bhagavad Puran talks about this beautiful place. He says, no, don't trust the religious books. They're always hyperbolic and they never represent the truth. I'm not going into the secular versus religious narrative, but that's what Krishna said. I don't trust him. Is there a secular reference to Vrindavan? He said, yes, there is. Vrindavane chaitra ratha danune. Mridu pravalo tar poshpashaye. It's fantastically beautiful place. Perfectly ecologically balanced in all dimensions, social, natural, political, economic, blah, 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 blah. Vrindavane Chaitra Dharanune, it belittles even the divine, um, what you call gardens in its beauty. As soon as he heard Kalidas from Raghuvansha, Krishna took the bait and he jumped into Vrindavan. He jumped into Vrindavan to learn about Seva, about Bhakti. Because Bhagavat also had says, Dhanyam Brindavanam Tena Bhakti Nirtyati Yatracha. The glory of Brindavan is because of one factor, because it is the place of Seva, Bhakti, in full bloom. So he came. He came. But what did he see? What did he see? When Krishna came, if you see the accounts, the waters were poisonous, the winds were tornadoes, the forests were on fire. Everything was upside down in nature. It's an ecological environmental disaster, total. His own uncle was ready to kill him. That was the compassion, that was the social order. And political exploitation was the worst kind. Everything was upside down, whatever he was told. So Krishna held his ears like this. He said, never trust any promotional literature. The more glossy, the more false it is. But Krishna being Krishna. If we were Krishna, we would have not stayed on in Vrindavan, in that chaos, <clears throat> in that disaster. But Krishna said, this was my choice to jump in here. I have landed with a parachute. I will get what I desired. Although I did not get what I desired, but I will get what I desire. How to do that? So he resolved to get he joined the, what you call the Seva Vidyale, Bhakti Vidyale in Vrindavan, which primarily teaches how to relate. Because relation itself is the key to any happiness in human life our relationship with money, with objects, with human beings, with nature, everything is relational. So relation is the key. Relation is simple, but the difficult part is how to maintain the relation, how to sustain the relation. And for that, seva comes handy. 
if you want to maintain relationship in any domain, any field, you have to serve with whom you are related. And you have to serve out of love selflessly. That is what the primary lesson of the school of Vrindavan was given to Krishna. And who was the teacher? The teacher were very interesting. The teacher was nature himself, Prakriti. Who will teach the Purusha? Krishna is the Param Purusha. The only other part of reality is Prakriti. Purush and Prakriti, the metaphysics tells us Ishwar Krishna in Sankhya Karika, he tells us Purush and Prakriti, they are the sum total. So the divine is getting lessons from the mother nature. Mother nature, what it teaches Krishna by, ex by living, that nature always giving without expectation. The rivers flow without agenda. The winds blow without any give and take. The sun shines without expecting anything in return. The mother earth sustains us without any expectation. Rather, all of natural elements suffer. They take pain with our interaction with them. They are very happy and healthy when the so-called animal called human being are not interacting with nature. The mother nature is shining, dancing, and happiest. The COVID lockdown has proved it. When we are back in our relationship with the nature, we bring disaster. We give only pain. We give only exploitation. We give only pollution. But still, the rivers are bringing fresh water to us. However you pollute them, they still give you fresh water. However you pollute the air, still they are bent upon giving the oxygen to us. How many trees you cut, there is still more trees ready to be cut. So to take pain without expecting anything in return. Having graduated from the school of bhakti in Vrindavan, Krishna then says, I have taken the lesson, but I have to pay my fees. I have to give my Guru Dakshana. So he gives the Guru Dakshana back to the mother nature. Uh, Gitesh ji, how are we doing with time? Because Krishna is timeless. We can go ahead, Acharya ji. Okay. So I will try to be a little bit quick. So if we see when Krishna is growing up in Vrindavan, in Braj, as a cowherd boy, a kid next block, that's what his identity is. He can be taken for a ride by his friends. He can be accused, he can be called names. There's no sign of divinity in Krishna at all, at all. But what he does, he gives Guru Dakshana back to the five elements of nature. By the simple trick of eating the mud, he cleans the mother earth of his place because he and his friends continue eating the mud. The parents chastise them. They don't stop eating the mud. And then the tube light is lit in the minds of the parents that the kids will not stop tasting the mud. Better you keep it clean. With one simple childish act, the pollution of the mother earth was done away with. Krishna drank the fire to quench it. Davan and Pankya, Barbara, made the fire element happy. He controlled the Trinavartas by planting so many trees. He strangulated the tornadoes. How do you strangulate tornadoes? By planting trees. 
So the air element was taken care of and water we all know how he jumped into the poisonous river and he churned the poison away, uh, sedimentation karke, he dumped it in the ocean and yamuna nirvisha bhavat. Samrita jala yamuna. It became again a pure water. And the space pollution, the most deadly pollution we suffer from is the pollution of sound. Shabd mayo gunaha akasha. Annam Bhatt has told us in Tarka Sangraha, Shabd gunamayo akasha. Sound. For that, he became the flute player and filled this space with the melodies of love and peace. One thing is very intriguing. While doing all this, while growing up and living and playing in Braj, he is a very ruthless lover or ruthless killer. I do not know. Probably he's both. Whoever comes, whoever comes in whatever disguise, wherever the evil comes in a disguise of a bird or an animal or a cow or a calf, Krishna does not wink the eye and kills. Killing is the only answer for Krishna for the evil. He doesn't stop. Although he is called the greatest lover ever born, but he is a ruthless killer. But except for one, Kaliya, he does not kill Kaliya. He kills a serpent called Aghasura, but Kaliya he doesn't kill. To cut the story short, is the Kaliya Daman Leela. Never Kaliya Bad Leela. Kaliya Daman, containment. So Krishna says, pollution is the deadliest evil. It cannot be killed. Pollution cannot be killed. It can't be only contained. So better, do not pollute. Me as the Supreme God, even I cannot kill pollution. I can merely segregate it and dump in the ocean as the civilized world is doing today. The deadliest poisons are being dumped into the Asia Pacific Rim. And that is the biggest political challenge today. So he says, better do not pollute. So having done that, Krishna said that ecology has more colors, has more colors. And I will just touch in different colors because all these different colors need in-depth analysis and understanding. He says, the environmental ecology, the natural ecology cannot be sustained if you do not have the economic system and resources. Dhanat dharmam. He quotes from Mahabharata and he says, Dhanat dharmam tato sukham, tato jayam. Dhan is required. The economic resources should be proper. <clears throat> and here, if I use the proper language, Krishna took a crash course in Gandhian Sivagram economic system. Listen to me again. I cannot say Gandhi took lessons in Krishna's economic thinking. That will be a wrong narrative. The proper narrative today in 2021, I don't know whether it will be corrected or not. If you correct it, it will be a different color. So Gandhi gave him a lesson, crash course in economy, and Gandhi told Krishna, the economy should be need-based, not greed-based. And Krishna says it time and again in Bhagavad Purana. Time and again, he's saying this. And he says, following Gandhi, Krishna says, producer has the first right of use on the product. Only the surplus can be traded. And for that, Krishna had a technology of a slingshot, slingshot, a small pebble he gave to his uh, friends and he says, whoever export these illegal exports, 
to the markets of Kansa in Mathura because market forces are always very tempting. It forces the producer to sell underpriced. Krishna put a ban. There'll be no export of milk, butter, yogurt, ghee, or anything from Braj to the markets of Mathura. And any illegal export will be destroyed. Kankadiya Mohemari or Gagariya Phoradali. With one pebble, he achieved the economic revolution. And when the producers were powerful, it became seller's market because the malls in Mathura wanted goods. Muhammad nahi the. Then they came to the knees and they begged the producer to supply. And with that strength, Krishna always said, Anna dyade sambibhagaha. That is the essential definition of dharma, which sustains humanity. An adi sambhivaga, equitable distribution of food and other material resources. I do not know if Marx is speaking through Krishna. So having got that, having got the economic power, he says the economic power cannot be sustained unless we have the political power. Correct. And he coming from a Ganarajya. Krishna was a member of the oldest Ganarajya this country ever had, the Vrishni and Andhaka Ganarajya. He was a member of a Ganarajya, a republic. So he could not tolerate a tyrant, exploitative power like Kansa. He dislodged him and put a popular leader like Ugrasen in that place. But soon he realized, soon he realized that politicians cannot deliver anything if there is no proper governance. Bureaucracy is more important than the political force. He realized it very quickly. And who was the chief secretary? The chief secretary was Uddhava. Shishyo Brahaspatir Sakshat Uddhavo Buddhi Sattamaha. Vrishni Nam Pravaro Mantri. He was a Mahamantri of the Vrishni Republic. He was a great scholar, but he was missing something. He did not have access to the technology of service. And if the bureaucracy is not trained in the service technology, it will become exploitative. I'm not talking about IAS officers of India. They're all good servants. They never exploit, they never deviate from their vows. So Uddhava was sent to gopis to take a crash course in bhakti and seva. And when Uddhava came back, returned trained in bhakti, trained in the mode of seva, Krishna was assured <clears throat> and he moved on. He moved on to Dwarika, which where he will knock at the door of Mahabharata. He will knock at the door of Mahabharata. But only the political arena is not the guarantee, the bureaucratic and economic and natural ecology is not ecology. He says the individual is the core of ecology. If the individual is not together, then there is no ecology at all. And he says the individual leads to the social systems. So these two should be also ecologically balanced. And for that, he speaks in Gita. Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishta Guna Karma Vibhagasha. Today is 30th January. So we remember of another Mohandas another admirer of our Mohan, Krishna. You know what he said? He says this Varnashram Dharma is the most scientific social system ever invented by humanity. I repeat it. This is Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. 
in a very famous article where he says, why am I a Hindu? That is the title of the article. And he says, I am a Hindu because I believe in Varnashram Dharma, which is the most scientific social invention of humanity. And Krishna knew this problem, the social problem of organization. He says it has been corrupted. It has become by birth. Krishna said that is ridiculous. If you take Varnashram Dharma by birth, then you are doomed. You are finished. You will kill yourself. Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishta Gun Karma Vibhagsha. The division will be professional, not by birth. So the tension was already there in Krishna's time, and Krishna gave the remedy through this the individual ecology and the social ecology. And there also Krishna said, all this ecology will depend upon one thing. The challenge is what is the way to restore this ecology? The challenge is what is the yoga? What is the way? What will make it possible? So he struggled with the yogas, the jnana yoga, you have to know the problem. You should have the will to solve the problem, the karma. And then you should also have the bhava to implement that karma. Without the bhava, nothing will happen. So jnana yoga, karma yoga and bhakti yoga, he emphasized, but he says the mother of the yogas is bhakti. So jnana and karma are the children of uh, what you call um, seva, seva as the mother. And he says, what kind of seva? The seva not hypocritical, not done out of compulsion, that will be no good. But seva, if we can do just out of love, as he was taught by the mother nature, the nature serves humanity or creation without expecting anything in return. It is possible. It is possible. So for that, you know what Krishna did? Bhagavad Gita was not sufficient. So he goes beyond Bhagavad Gita and he gives two more Gitas in Bhagavad Purana. One is Uddhav Gita, which is like a shorter version of Bhagavad Gita to reiterate what he has already said in the mundane domain. But in the domain of aesthetics and spirituality and art and other side, he gives another Gita, which is only in four shlokas in the 10th canto of 30, 30, 32nd chapter of Bhagavad Puran. It is called Prema Gita. And he gives that to gopis. That what is love? He says, love as a return to love, he says, is business. It is not love. If you can love without expecting anything in return, if you can love for the sake of love without grinding any other acts of vested interest, that is love. So he said, the gopis asked, is it possible? Is it humanly possible? He said, yes, it is humanly possible. And there comes the real agenda of Krishna intervening in human history. That is the center point, what I want to emphasize today. He says, Purush is incomplete without the Prakriti. And what is Prakriti? Prakriti has two meanings in Sanskrit, mother nature, and Prakriti also means the feminine. Purush is masculine, and Prakriti is the feminine, the female. Without female having full glory, 
Purush is in suffering. So when there was a Akashwani in Krishna's avatar time, which Brahma listened, he says, Vasudeva grihe sakshat janishyate purushah para tat priyartham. For the sake of his beloved, Krishna is taking incarnation only for one reason, which is given by Bhagavat, tat priyartham. Only in the service of his priya, he is taking his birth in Braj. He is manifesting on earth. And one Rasika of Krishna who wanted to know who this bloody intriguing Krishna is, his triple bent, his crooked, his understanding is also very difficult and crooked. So he came to Braj. He, he looked into the holy books of Hindus. He had no clue. The books could not decipher what Krishna is. Then he asked the people. They could not satisfy what is Krishna in himself. So he did not become hopeless. He kept on searching, 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 searching. is a historical event I'm narrating. And this searcher is a Muslim. His name was Ras Khan. So Ved Mepur Dhundo Purana Ne Kayan. I searched in the Vedas, I searched in the Puranas, I had no clue about Krishna. Rasakhan Batayon a Logu Lagayan. No man or woman of Braj could satisfy me who Krishna is. So Dhunat Dhunat. I kept on searching, kept on searching. What did I see? In a bower, he was hidden somewhere in the bower of Vrindavan. He was massaging the feet of Radhika. And that, Ras Khan says, he is the Param Purusha, he is the absolute male who can massage the feet of the female, only he can be the absolute male. So in that fashion, if you see, to give the example, a living example of his Prema Gita, the love for the sake of love, what is Krishna's relationship to Radha? Who is Till they met last in their life, Radha was almost double the age of Krishna and Krishna was not even in the pubic age. What kind of relationship could be? Was it physical and sexual? Or is Radha wife of Krishna like Rukmani's and 16,008? Or is she Devaki, mother? Radha and Krishna has no social markation, marking. Completely outside social relationships. Completely outside. And that's what Vrindavan calls the Parkiya Bhav. A transcendental relationship where the relation is for the sake of relating. That's all. Where the relation is to compete with each other to please the other. If Radha can please Krishna, Krishna can massage the feet of Radha equally. There's a competition between the two. And that's why 16,108 wives have to wait. But Radha is always there with Krishna, even 5,000 years later. Just because of that pure relationship of love and service. And then the most difficult thing is that what kind of man is he? In his harem, he has 16,108 women. And it's a fact. It is not a fake news. It is not a fake uh, Facebook news or WhatsApp news. Narad went and personally checked 
and this beautiful chapter on this in um, Bhagavad Puran, when he landed in Dwarka, he was worried, you know, do patan ke beech mein sabat bachana koi. If somebody has a wife and a mistress, his life is finished. I'm not saying there may be some brave people sitting in front of me, but Krishna had 16,108 wives and equal number of girlfriends, gopis. How is he managing himself? When he leads, lands there in Dwarika, Krishna is away. He visits many households and every household says, every queen of Krishna says, Krishna loves me, cares for me most. What kind of man is he? And why does he want to have 16,000 108 wives. In Dwarika, he got Rukmani, Satyabhama, Nagni, Jiti, blah, blah, blah. Were they not enough? Eight? No. There was a king called Bhomasura, a maniac. I cannot use the uncivilized language. A maniac. Wherever he, see, he will see a beauty, whether a daughter or a sister, or a wife or a mother of anybody, he will forcibly take her and exploit. And in his captivity and exploitation, 16,100 women were suffering. They sent a petition to Krishna through Satyabhama. Krishna was enraged. How come women exploited? <coughs> Immediately, Satya Bhama and Krishna land to Bhamasur's place. Bhamasur welcomes Krishna, Dwarka Dhisha. Then Krishna asks him to release all the women. Bhamasur says, It is my personal problem. Who are you, Mr.? He says, No, you are a king, you are a ruler, and ruler's life is in public domain. King's life is in public domain. So if you want to keep 16,100 women in your harem, you marry them, you make them queens. Give them their worth. Give them their asmita, their status. You cannot exploit them. There was a fight, and in that fight, Bahamasur was killed. Krishna freed every woman. The moment the women were freed, they realized where to go. Which husband will take them back? Which brother will respect? Which mother will give affection to such exploited lot? If you remember the movie called Pinjer, the girl which was forcibly taken just for one night, the father, when she comes back home, the father says, you are no more good for us. They said, we are social waste. We have nowhere to go. And Krishna said, it is not possible. In this world, there is nothing is called waste. He said, my most adorable embellishment and decoration is a animal waste, is a bird waste, is a morpunk is a discarded refuge of a bird, but that is the most aesthetically pleasing and important decoration for me. There is nothing waste in this world and woman can never be waste. From today, you are all queen of Dwarika. And that is the most glorious chapter of feminism ever written in human history. You give me any example where a male, a male of power, because Dwarka Dhish was the absolute powerful man, Kaurav and Pandavas are vying with each other to get his sanction and his support. That powerful man gives that kind of respect. He shares his visiting card for that kind of women. Even in 2021, 
I do not find a parallel to what Krishna did for the service of a family. Service of family. Absolute glorious. And he married them and each woman had her palace and they reported to Narada that Krishna loves her most than even Rukmani or Satya Bhama or anything. That is what Krishna is. Male and female. So I do not know. I must wind it up. I must wind it up. This Purush and Prakriti coming together. Krishna, if I use another category, and if Krishna is not angry to me, I would like to call him the green god. Krishna will revolt. He will say, no, 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 no. I am the blue god. I am not the green god. But I will just remind him that, dear Krishna, you are nothing without Radha. You are, you, if, you are, if Radha is not there as your potency, you are like a dead bulb without electricity. So when Radha and you are together, the complexion becomes green. Yadha is yellow, goldish, and you are blue, and blue and yellow mixed together are green. So you are the green god, and you are also green god in the modern narrative modern narrative, because who is the governing deity of Krishna's arena of play, Vrindavan? And you will be surprised, it is Vrinda. Vrinda means vessel, Tulsi ka podha, which is the supreme goddess for Krishna. Not Radha, vessel, Tulsi. Why? Why? Because it is the play of love and service. And in the arena of service, give and take has to be transcended. Business has to be foregone. That is of le lower level. So Tulsi is, if Tulsi will forgive me, is a useless plant. It cannot give wood fire. It cannot make any furniture. It cannot give any shelter. It is so fragile that you put pour more water, it dies. If you, uh, 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 in my uh, garden, all the tulsi uh, plants have died because of the cold. And if there is more sun, it also perishes. It is so fragile and vulnerable. And Krishna never uh, climbs on tulsi tree and to play his flute. He climbs on tamal and this and that, kadamba. But why Tulsi he makes? He chooses purposefully, he says, because Tulsi cannot give you anything. And that's how she has the absolute power to give everything. One who cannot give anything can give everything. That is love. And on the reverse of it, Chaha gayi chinta miti manwa be parva or jinko kachu na chahiye wohi shahanshah. So this saintly saying Krishna reversed. Three dimensions of Krishna's leelas, Braj, Mathura, and Yamuna. Which female accompanies him all the three places? I will keep this option question open for the discussion, if I leave any time for the discussion, I do not know. Who is the female which Krishna keeps along with him in Vrindavan, in Mathura and Dwarka? And you know what he does? Krishna's God is also a green God. For Krishna, Krishna is not God. For Krishna, Govardhan Hill is the God. He worships the hill, the trees, the cows. He's a green god. His religion is a green god religion. And you know, very interesting. When he's trying to protect the environment and is killing so many demons, he never uses any weapon. And that is Krishna beyond Mahabharata. 
although he tries to continue a weaponless warrior, but Bhishma breaks his vow in Mahabharata. But in Braj, he never invokes any of his weapons, never, ever. So his killing is also very green, very organic killer he is, very peacefully he kills, you know, without any materialistic support, without any technological support, it is very organic and humane killing he gives to all the evil. So that is fascinating to me. <clears throat> Why he is worshipping? Because Govardhan Hill is taken as Bhakta. So Krishna turns the tables again. The Bhakta becomes Bhagwan, And Bhagwan Krishna becomes the Bhakta of Govardhan. Haridas Varyaha is the title of Govardhan Hill in Bhagavad Purana. Is the chief bhakta of Krishna, Govardhan. So Krishna worships the bhakta. So that is another dialectic that how God becomes the devotee and devotee becomes the God in a beautiful way. So Krishna, in that fashion, if I can conclude, if in that fashion, Krishna as Swayam Bhagavan with his three dimensions of Leelas, Mathura, Braj, and Dwarika, but he also has another dimension, the dimension of Raslila. This Raslila provides us with a stage or a theater where the seemingly opposite can dance together. Male and female, seemingly opposite, but unless they come together, the opposites come together, there is no ras, there is no dalliance, there is no complete of rasa. Man and nature, religion and politics, spirituality and economics, and the unseen. If these opposing forces do not come together, we try today, we try to solve the ecology in all the dimensions with a kind of uh, stand alone solutions like politics can be solved by politics. Economy can be solved by economy. Ecology can be solved by science. This singular approach, we have done enough. Poverty can be elevated by money. These singular approaches have failed us. Krishna said, you have to bring the harmony. You have to have a Ras Leela. You have to have a Raslila of different approaches together. If those approaches come together in the theater of Ras, where the center is the good and welfare of humanity and rest all are the players. Krishna is alone and there are several gopis. He's giving the message very clear, very clear. But he says also very clearly in the beginning of creation, he told Brahma, Jnanam param goyam me yat vijjana samanvitam. My knowledge should be accepted, only that knowledge should be accepted which is synoptically understood through scientific processes. Brahma asked, what is vijjana? He says, any knowledge systems whose conclusions are universally applicable and empirically verifiable is scientific. Amazing definition given by Krishna to science. Conclusions universally applicable and empirically verifiable are scientific. So in that way, Krishna Swayam Bhagavan, Satchida Ananda Vigraha, Sat, Chit and Ananda. If Krishna had not been there, there would have not been any Moksha Dharma Prakarana there had been no Upanishads because what is Krishna? Krishna is Sat, Chit, Ananda, Vigraha, embodiment of these three primordial foundations of Indian narrative, Indian discourse. Satyam, Jnanam, Anandam, Brahma. That is the primordial foundation on which the whole palace of Indianness stands even today. And Krishna manifests that in his three-dimensional sat, 
Chit and Ananda. Sat and Chitta more available in Mahabharata, but Ananda is beyond, little beyond it. But we need Sat and Chitta for Ananda. If Sat and Chitta, the knowledge and the will are not there, then the feeling, which is a thicker experience, will not dawn. And this whole explosion of Vedanta, which is the USP of India today, would have not been there if the moksha dharma of Mahabharat had not been there. And if the Vedanta is thriving today and taking new dimensions, this Sat, Chit, and Ananda as the manifestations of the Absolute. I bow down to the Kesi Bhattacharya. I bow down to Professor T.R.B. Murthy, where they mention about the alternating absolutes, not duplicating absolutes, not translations, not redundant phenomena, but alternating absolutes, which Bhagavat says, Vadanti tattat vidas tattvam yajjanam adhvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan eti chapdate. The reality is non-dual. Listen to the Bhagavad. The reality is non-dual, <clears throat> but because of the path of approach, it appears as Brahman when we are cognitively approaching it. It appears as Paramatma or Shiva when we are cognitively approaching it. And it appears as Bhagavan when we are approaching it through the emotive or the path of feeling. So knowing, willing, and feeling is the Indian yoga given us by Gita and elaborated by Srimad Bhagavat. This Mahabharat is two dimensional, Sat and Chitta, and two into four is Chatur Varga is established, but we need the three-dimensional Bhagavad Puran and we need the Pancham Purusharth. Prema Pamartho Mahan, the loving mode of service is the fifth, this thing. We do not want to be strangled by the logic of binary opposites, but rather we want the binary opposites to dance together in a fuzzy logic of Achint Bheda Bhedwad. The story will be long and that story for some other morning. And I thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful for providing me this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Bala. And thank you, Acharya Srivat Goswamiji. His words rooted in Indian philosophical tradition touched our heart and mind simultaneously, putting us all on a newer track of reflection on Mahabharat and beyond to know about Krishna as a philosopher, environmentalist, conservationist, and feminist. Acharyaji, you touched on the multifaceted spirit of Krishna while explicate, explicating how Krishna was self-tormented by his own resolution of service of all. And it is because of this that we see an exhausting flow of innumerable virtues of Krishna emerging in Mahabharat and beyond. And yes, the whole spirit of service and tolerance are lessons for us for today. Shivasji, you have presented before us a very refreshing and newer dimensions of perceiving, understanding, and studying Krishna. Acharyaji, allow me to share that through this ongoing project, we are making a small attempt to revisit the Mahabharat and Bhagavad Gita in light of the present situation. Your good wishes and guidance are very important for us so that we are able to present and represent the gur, the jaggery like Mahabharat and Puha, the pancake like Bhagavad Gita in their academic styles, as well as that we are able to have many more 
thoughtful engagements with the epic. On behalf of the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, Kamla Nehru College, University of Delhi, Professor Bala, and our team of Spark Project, and I must not forget our all participants present here, as well as myself, I thank Acharya Shivas Goswamiji for sparing so much time for us on Saturday, the 30th of January, to help us grasp the Sat Chind Ananda Vigra in Krishna. That's one lesson I'm taking back from today's session. Your words have encouraged us and inspired all of us. Our sincere gratitude to you, Acharyaji. I'm grateful for letting me in in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.